Hello and welcome to this film podcast that we don't have a name for and we're so unorganized uh, to get it started, but uh, <laughs> we're all film students here who study together and uh, we're bored uh, and we want to talk about movies, so this is our excuse to do it. Bored, uh, borderline depressed? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> That's not that different. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I feel like this is simultaneously the best and worst time to start a podcast. We're like right in that sweet spot where you can just interpret it however you want. Kind of like this movie. I don't know. <laughs> no, <laughs> no exactly. wow. Nice segue. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> um, I think it's funny because I feel like most people had their like, oh, we should start a podcast in like March or, or <laughs> maybe, maybe April. And we've, we've meandered on to it. But finally, there's a reason to. Um, uh, so let's let's get some introductions going uh, and we'll do it with a question Uh, what is the best movie that y'all have seen on Netflix during this pandemic in honor of the film we're talking about oh so that was like the actual question I I didn't know that was going to be that we'll start we'll we'll, we'll start with uh, me I guess because I'm ready for the question Uh, I'm going to go with uh, my name is Caleb Turner, and I'm going to go with Candyman, because uh, I hadn't Ooh. seen it yet, and I watched it with my little brother, and it was just the most artful slasher that I've ever seen, and I love slashers, so that's my answer. All right, I, I'm ready to go, too, I guess. My name is Arjun Fisher, and I, I would say School Days, which was I, when I was catching up on all my Spike Lee, it was on Netflix, but they took it off, so I don't know if that counts. So I'll, I'll add Starship Troopers to that, which I watched for the first time on Netflix a couple weeks ago and just fell in love, so. Cool. Uh, Brooke, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> um... I, I don't know, I guess I'm going to go out on a limb here and say uh, the classic The Wedding Planner um, <laughs> because <laughs> I watched it last night. Great film. Jennifer Lopez, Matthew McConaughey, I think, um, made me want to be. Think. I, think, I think it was him. He had a weird hairstyle back then. Um, <laughs> and it made me want to be a wedding planner. It's on the list of jobs that I will eventually do in my life um if i don't get hired for anything in the film world i will plan anyone's wedding uh so yeah also i'm brooke (laughs) 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 um i'm alicia and i'm frantically scrolling through letterbox i would say probably the five bloods um and also i mean like on a completely different kind of like plane but also I think like an underrated like feel good type of thing. Banana Split was very um, cute and enjoyable. And I, I don't think I know that, that one. Which, what is it has split? that girl who looks like Debbie Ryan and um, <laughs> this other girl who's about to be huge. And then Dylan Sprouse is like kind of like half in it. Which Sprouse um, brother is that? Is it, is that the dick pic one or is that the other one? There's a um, dick pic Sprouse I brother. Think it, isn't I think he was the one with the dick pic, okay. right, Dylan? I, Not I the Riverdale one. I'm so oh. bad at the Sprouses. I can <laughs> the never one who keep opened them. a meadery in New York. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, speaking of, of dick pics and the fi- and film world, oh, Chris, yo, Evans. Wow. Chris Evans. Chris Evans, right? Chris Evans. I know. Wait, but was it actually his? Or... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I do love all of the people around him, like Mark Ruffalo, just like tweeting at him. <laughs> Somebody tweeted like, yes. don't the Avengers have a group chat? And that's really been sticking with me the past day. Like, you'd think that there would be some sort of text message chain with all of them on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah true. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. Well, if if the listener hasn't figured it out already, we're talking about <laughs> a new Netflix movie by Charlie Kaufman. I'm thinking of ending things. Um, and before we, we start diving in on, on what all even that title means, uh, <laughs> what did you guys think of it in the most non-spoiler way possible before we dive into spoilers? Good? Bad? The experience of watching it, I think, was pretty incredible. Like, I kind of lost myself in it, especially the first of the two times I checked it out. But I, I found it, like, the more I try to decipher it, like the less I like it, I think in a sense, but the, the first time I watched it, I was just absolutely enthralled. I was so sucked in. I would say I'm 
well not the opposite but i mean yeah i was very i was very like engrossed as i watched it um but also like i went through waves of exhaustion um for sure and you know i wasn't enjoying every second of it but that doesn't mean i didn't appreciate every second of it and i actually the more i dissect it um the more i like it so but that's me with like most movies even with movies that i think like don't even require a lot of (laughs) dissection i just like to be like oh they could have meant this they definitely (laughs) didn't but uh i like it better that way Hmm. yeah um i feel like I I had an interesting viewing experience because I watched it with my older brother who is just he's not a movie guy like he's kind of your your average American like probably sees the Marvel movies maybe a Fast and Furious uh, every <laughs> once in a while um, you know whatever whatever you know grabs him but I was like hey you're free tonight I'm free tonight let's let's sit down and watch this Charlie Kaufman film. And I showed him the trailer, and somehow he was still interested <laughs> in seeing it. And so I, while I was watching it, I was watching it through his lens, like, thinking about what he was thinking about it. Because um, you if you've ever, like, shown, like, an art house film to a friend who just is not interested in art house film, like, <laughs> you're, like, you know, looking around, like, like oh, did, I thought that was cool. Did you think you know, that was cool? So... Yeah, like, I remember the first time I showed First Reform to a bunch of of my friends, like, at the end of it, they were like, yeah, we are never letting Arjun (laughs) choose the movie ever again. (laughs) Yeah, but uh, my older brother, actually, he liked liked the movie. He did, he he was really interested in the puzzle box of it all. Um, And so, for me, I, I agree that it was, like, enchanting and really just sort of spellbinding watching it, trying to decipher it. And I've had a lot of fun thinking about it and I haven't stopped thinking about it. And um, I'm curious to hear y'all's interpretations because the more I think about it, the more I've like solidified what I think. And I'm like, this is the way that the thing is, which is I don't think how most people (laughs) see those movies. So uh, Brooke, what'd you think? Yeah, (laughs) Um, I felt like I needed to be like, wearing a turtleneck and smoking a cigar or something as I was watching it but I was just like in my pajamas in my bed in my laptop and it felt like not quite right but um yeah I I think I liked it it made me very depressed but then also very relatable as someone who (laughs) um I don't know like a while back there was a tweet that went viral that was like shout out to all the like the sexual tension between like me and the kid that's my same age like at the hotel lobby and I was like absolutely and one of my friends like screenshotted it and it said like Brooke Reese liked this or whatever on Twitter and they were like Brooke what the fuck are you talking about and I was like does no one else do that so as someone who fantasizes about my (laughs) romantic life with many a stranger uh, I felt a little called out <laughs> about it, and yeah, I feel a little bit depressed for my future life, and a little bit wary of like hypothermia. Uh, so those were my <laughs> those were my main takeaways. Uh, but yeah, we can dive into that later if you want to talk about like if you want to talk about yeah, like the medical things with hypothermia and like you start to feel really like I already knew this like I don't know I guess I'm like I I know some people in the medical field and I'm also a bit of like a hypochondriac and think I'm constantly dying so I'm like hyper aware um and like when you get hypothermia towards the end you start to feel like super hot and start stripping and getting naked so I was like uh oh, we're nearing the end for this man's life but yeah (laughs) I don't know I really like that you uh I did not expect our conversation to um, <laughs> dive deep into the like hypothermia process. But yep, <laughs> I appreciate. Well, that's it. interesting you bring up hyper hypochondriacs because like I notably like Signetic in New York like very much is like obsessed with that one character who just like cannot stop thinking about like what is wrong with her and like going to the doctor over and over again. And I feel like his new movies at least are so plagued with like the idea of overthinking things and just like obsessing over small details that nobody else outside of your own head is ever going to focus on and it's like such this interior process that is just so fascinating Interiority. to dive into Interiority. Yeah. <laughs> and nature yeah, and i 
that's whole that's like Kaufman's whole oeuvre is just diving deeper and deeper into his his own skull which <laughs> I think this is almost the most like I think this might be even after Synecdoche New York this might be his least accessible movie maybe in a way where it's like I feel like you have to be primed for what his movies are to get the most out of it uh, or get or uh, I don't know maybe the most out of it is a little condescending but to to really like be open to its ideas and to be right. open to how full of himself and how self-indulgent <laughs> he is um, yeah is like this is not thing. where you would tell anybody to start if you were telling them to dive into charlie kaufman oh yeah. but exactly. this is where i started <laughs> Which is, i haven't God. seen any other films but like i had a friend who texted me being like i'm j like i need you to watch this and i'm so tired of like <laughs> like men <laughs> and like it's completely fair i feel like he's i mean you know he's forever doomed to both um self-indulge and critique his own self-indulgence so we're just gonna have to live with that because he yeah. does with much difficulty <laughs> mm -hmm. but... did you, did <laughs> oh you wait but i also can i have a confession really quick yeah please <laughs> i i'm so, i'm terrified to say this to a group of capital f film majors but <laughs> I still have not seen Synecdoche, New York, and neither have I. <laughs> just because, like, when I'm never in the mood to like destroy myself, so and I thought I was like, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it, because I still hadn't seen adaptation too. Like all the Kaufman that I'd, I'd seen wasn't directed by him; it was directed by Spike or um, uh, Eternal Sunshine. So I was like, oh, I'll I'll like do a catch up, and so I watched adaptation, then I watched I'm Thinking of Ending Things, and I was planning to watch Synecdoche and then it wasn't even necessarily I thought I would be on like emotional overload but more intellectual I was like I want to be able to process this movie and I feel like if I fill my brain with like it's an emotional more overload Kaufman, too I'll, to be fair yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean yeah that too but yeah just wanted to get that out there and I feel <laughs> 50 pounds lighter oh no that's I mean yeah try I went into Synecdoche knowing nothing about it. Like somehow it had escaped. I, I was maybe 18. It had escaped my like film knowledge. And I was like, oh, I, I know Tra Charlie Kaufman. He did Eternal Sunshine. Like that. And I think that was the only other film of his that I'd seen. And my roommate at the time was like, yeah, you got to watch this. This is good. You like movies? Here, here it is. And I, it, it is, it is not for for it's not a fun viewing necessarily like it's a great <laughs> film i think but you don't come out of it loving the world or yourself so. yeah well that's interesting like do you think that changed here like what were you guys do, do you think this is like a mostly nihilistic movie because that's kind of the impression i got with the ending but it's also such like an ambiguous ending it's hard for me to really wrap my head around it like like you're saying you think your way is the right way or your interpretation is the right interpretation and that's not necessarily like the canon so far of the internet reactions and like i feel like that's sort of the point but i couldn't help but feel so pessimistic after watching this <laughs> the first time <laughs> i was depressed as hell to be honest after watching it like and i don't know if you guys so okay my interpretation uh is that is that janitor man is jake and he is looking back on where his life went wrong and where he failed and he's conflating his artistic failures with his inability to connect with uh, anyone, specifically a woman. And uh, because of this, he decides that he's just going to wait in his car and die. Uh, and that was my interpretation of, of the ending. I don't know if that's where y'all landed, but I found the, the whole thing to be so depressing as someone, and as you guys can probably all relate, as someone who is like creative and like, likes art and wants to be a part of that world like i found that so incredibly daunting and like depressing to be like this is a possibility of where you could end up if you really <laughs> send yourself down that path and whew. i agree with your interpretation and i think that for i went in blind not knowing like literally anything except that it was the new kaufman and um from what i've heard and people talking about the source material like that seems to be correct. Um, and I I enjoyed, like, I, I also didn't really solve the puzzle until after I'd watched it and, like, w started reading about it. Um, but I, And I enjoy the puzzle, but I, I enjoy the um, 
other aspects even more I think just like digging into yeah not only the I yeah I was crippling de- cripplingly depressed after watching this I had to watch dog videos until like 2 a.m <laughs> um but like the fear of dying alone and also yeah the not necessarily solely the like romantic side of it but also the artistic side of it him like desperately wanting you know being a lover of art and wanting to be a creator but just finding that like his talents are not enough to be a creator so he can't like be a participant and like it's almost like if you took ed wood or the disaster artist or something and made it like really devastating like (laughs) instead of this kind of joyful take on like people who aren't necessarily conventionally talented and just doing what they love to do anyway this is you know the side of things where like you either give up or you're just like forever disappointed in yourself and disappointing everyone else around you um so yeah i would say these are these are all solid fears of mine and um, <laughs> to them perfectly. <laughs> that just made me think of like com- comparing it to synecdoche where it's almost the the inverse and Ar- Arjun help me if I'm totally off base because it's been a minute since I've seen Synecdoche where Caden Cotard is like actually genius right and, right but he just can't like like contain it and it just overgrows him and overwhelms him whereas I guess Jake is the opposite of that where he just doesn't yeah, I, I think that's that. a good point. And, like, I think Synecdoche is Kaufman kind of painting himself, a picture of himself, like, in his own view on the screen, where it's, like, he thinks of himself as a really talented, smart guy who's done some great things, but his ideas and his, like, thoughts about the world are sort of too big to put into the art that he wants to. And that's kind of what Synecdoche is, so it works. And here, I kind of feel like it's Kaufman... 10 years after Synecdoche, New York, he spent probably the last decade trying to put his finger on those exact issues that he was talking about and not still being able to figure it out. And I think this is him trying to put that onto the screen while exactly what you're saying, like talking about a guy who is sort of Kaufman if Kaufman never worked it out. If probably like, you know, Mm -hmm. he stuck, you know, making sketch comedy videos like he was doing in the 90s and never Mm -hmm. made being John Malkovich or something like that. And it's... Like you're saying, Alicia, like super depressing <laughs> as, you know, creative people or hopeful creatives like like we are. <laughs> yeah. Brooke, did you have any thoughts on coming into uh, I'm thinking of ending things blind on Kaufman? Um, yeah, so uh, obviously I was depressed, but I guess I like bounced back a little quicker than you guys. Um, I was only depressed for like. I don't know, maybe 30 minutes. But I also thought, like, <laughs> aspects of it were, were like, I thought, like, beautiful in some way. Um, I guess just, like, thinking about, like, at a very surface level, the idea that, like, I don't know, like, he could, like, re-explore a relationship, like, with his parents in some way or, like, some sort of something about how, like, people aren't really dead they live on in your like fucked up memories <laughs> and, like some sort of something like that and I was like I guess that part's nice and like I just chose to focus on those that like nicer aspect of like getting to like use your imagination to like forge a different path for you because like I guess in the end he like died maybe thinking of a better life for himself than the one that he actually had you know what i mean I and you know. find hope in that rather than yeah <laughs> <I> did. <laughs> incredible bless you brooke the I'm world needs do more an you optimistic spin i'm like oh at least he like died happy and you know you can just you can hang on to those memories because like uh i don't know you're gonna die alone eventually right like no one can die with you <laughs> unless like a murder suicide situation um, so <laughs> another uh, hopeful scenario yeah so you know all you got are your memories as you're like reliving i i kind of saw it as him like you know how you like uh, people say that you like your life flashes before your eyes and like his his own interpretation of his life flashed before his eyes before he froze to death so. but even even then like his own interpretation as manifested in the young woman is like Mm -hmm. fighting him the whole way and is like looking at the chinks in the armor trying to be like wait this isn't real wait like like the swing set like at the beginning where it's like wait what was that how did 
what why would that be there and then he's just like oh don't don't think about that you know right (laughs) yeah yeah Uh, i thought it was super interesting how he despite her character being a figment of his imagination that he gave her agency and he said in interviews that like you know part of it is you have to do that in order to have like a plot like for dramatic reasons and also um to kind of show that you know like this this guy like even in the world of his own creation things don't go the way that he wants them to but i think it's also like it it helps in the fact that um like it, i feel like a lot of people who already um have like ill will towards Kaufman's whole navel gazing sort of like depressed american man thing would really struggle with like a film that has you know like just a completely fictionalized agency less woman um for the whole time and also like i find it interesting that like this him as him being like the creator of one of the original iconic um manic pixie dream girls you know like he's kind of both critiquing and defending it at the same time in this as if you know like showing like kind of the danger of it and how it can be harmful to like the person creating this figment but also like the the person who is the figment and like at the same time showing you know like why like oh he had a depressing life and that's why he's doing this but then also that's kind of how he made clementine in the first place i feel like like he he had her character be like oh i'm not a concept you know kind of fighting the trope but at the same time he was reinforcing it by like you know basically the entirety of her character right because so the, Clem- was, the clementine yeah. we know is is in eternal sunshine is just completely in the memories of like mm-hmm. as filtered through yeah. uh joel was that was that the guy's joel, name? yeah i think so um, yeah and so, yeah, he is. I I was wanting to really ask you guys what you thought about, uh, like the 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 idea, literally what you're talking about, Alicia, of this like woman character who's like played by Jesse Buckley and is incredible. Really good. Like yeah, she's really such good. a great yeah. actress, mm-hmm. but and and has her own thoughts, and she's right. like the main character right. for most of it. But it's but like you know you, it's not, and so it's like is that is that something that can be read as feminist or is it inherently uh you know since it's originating from a a man's brain even if kaufman i think that's what you said alicia is that even as kaufman like looks at this thing and and he's and it's uh his creation he's critiquing it and he's critiquing that he's critiquing it and Mm -hmm. it's like that that whole of judging whether or not this film is like misogynistic it was like a mind bender for me and like right. i think you could right. like be you could be frustrated with it or you could think like what an amazing critique of how men view women and how they view how women should act in their lives or something i don't know yeah, yeah i think that's a really good point uh, but at the same time i'm not sure that everything we're seeing from jesse buckley's i don't know did she get a name her character I, her, a couple Lucy. names i guess she yeah. Got, yeah 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 but I think, yeah <laughs> or what, like, what is it credited as like the the young woman, the young woman. Young woman yeah. right well I'm, I'm not sure that everything we hear from her is necessarily supposed to be like a projection of jesse plemons's character because i do think that as much as this movie is about interiority and about specifically you know his male suicidal interiority i do think that we get her like you're saying we get her direct line of thought in a lot of in a lot of cases and I kind of think that in some of those cases especially when we get to the end and she makes that comment about how you know I didn't want to talk to you I don't even remember exactly what the line was but she's like remembering their first date or their first meeting at that trivia night differently than he remembered it and I do think that sometimes when we're getting her perspective it's not necessarily Jesse Plemons' projection of her, and it is, like, her actually coming through. But I I think he presents it with enough ambiguity that it's not, like, necessarily just there in the text, which I think is interesting, but I think, like you're saying, it's hard to, like, grasp exactly what he's going for there. And and I don't know. It's it's a hard question to wrap your head around. I have the the quote, because I wrote it down. I was re-watching scenes before this, and uh, she calls him, the young woman, when talking to the janitor, She's like, have you seen my boyfriend? And in his mind, he says, like, describe him. And then she says, like, he's a creep. 
just one of the thousands of non-interactions in my life. It's like describing a mosquito that bit you 40 years ago, which is just the most scathing way, I think, of describing somebody really? that you could ever do, which is, <laughs> it's interesting because it's like, it's, it's, if you're reading it literally, which I think is maybe not a helpful way to read it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's literally the janitor talking about himself and thinking about himself that way, which is again, incredibly depressing, but. I think I'd um, rather read it literally and think that uh, Jesse Plemons is a mosquito. He's just manifested <laughs> himself. <laughs> also, do you guys think that Jesse Plemons seems to be like filling the Philip Seymour Hoffman shaped hole in Kaufman's heart? He has like <laughs> that like pasty magnetism that I don't just like such a, I mean, such a like, I don't know if charismatic is the right word, especially in this movie, because he's just like right heavy but he you know he has the that je ne sais quoi as the, as the yeah say. all i the only thing i've seen him in was the like black mirror episode like oh, the yeah. uss callister or whatever right. which was like very similar to this mm -hmm. and it's like a man who wants to like obsessively control like in this case just a girl but like that one like a group of people or whatever all within like his mind so i definitely yeah he he just he creeps me out. No offense to yeah. him. I Googled, <laughs> I did a quick Google of him and he was like, yeah, he's a mixture of like Matt Damon and Philip Seymour Hoffman. And he's like married or yeah. like partnered with uh, Kirsten Dunst or whatever. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's surprising. But he just creeps me him. out. <laughs> no, no meth offense Damon. to him. Yeah, that was meth Damon. Exactly. <laughs> 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 I, I, I like kind of get, this is like not meant to be a knock toward Plemons, so I think it's awesome. But I also think, Philip Seymour Hoffman was so good. I mean, he was great at playing a creep, but he was also great at playing, like you're saying, like the sort of endearing, you know, likable character that I'm not sure Plemons has sort of excelled at yet. And like, I, I really, really loved his performance in Game Night, which is like one of my favorite recent performances. But I also think oh. like he runs the risk of getting a little typecast as like that creepy character actor. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're right. I I'm trying to remember his his character in Breaking Bad. It's been like years since I've seen it. Right, but right. isn't he just like a delightful idiot in that? That is true. Yeah, I, <laughs> I feel like I remember that. really liking his character, <laughs> even though he's like clearly a bad person. Yeah, doesn't he like kill a kid or something? <laughs> I, oh God. Yeah. Wait. Okay. Can we rewind? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Neil. What was that? You support infanticide? <laughs> <laughs> No, but but but, <laughs> but Clemens <laughs> does give a great performance, uh, and I think everybody does. I mean, Tony yeah, Collette. Yeah. Let's talk about Tony Collette and uh, David Dulles yeah. as the parents. Like, <laughs> you mean Professor Lupin? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I know him. Yeah, the acting in this film, I think, by everyone involved, uh, including the janitor, I think he gives a good performance. I too. do too. Uh, I do too. But particularly. David Thewlis and Tony Collette as the unhinged, like parents of Jake. Um, there's something about David Thewlis's like, like throaty, uh, accented, like tilting his head, like, "What did you think about the painting?" That like, <laughs> like has embedded itself in my mind. Spot on. Uh, that was, and also oh the bandaid on like, his head, like, yes, that keeps it just changing. kind of. This sounds bad, but like, it takes all your like kind of internalized like fears and biases about old people and like like, like throws the them foot? all onto you get like him. one shot of his like toes <laughs> yeah literally <laughs> yeah yeah literally <laughs> there's like there's a, there's a lot of things that I, I have a list of like unanswered like questions that i have about the the film and one of them is is about thulis and it's about his character's strange obsession with the young woman and how he'll like when he meets her he's like staring at her and then it shows jake like trying to shake his dad's hand but he's like fixated on her and then that happens again when they're sitting in the living room and he like is sitting like right next to her did you guys have any sort of opinion or ideas about why that is like my only thought was that maybe his dad was like maybe he did bring a girl home at one point when he was a kid and his dad was like creepy towards her and it like kind of made an imprint on his mind or something but i don't i don't know did you all have any thoughts 
I didn't even notice that, to be honest. That's a really good catch. I, and I, I don't know. It's fascinating that he's like a character that is portrayed so much as like the embodiment of like death and decay and entropy. But like you're saying, like clearly he's given some sort of like human grossness that's a little bit more than just like the embodiment of somebody just like dying basically i'm i'm not sure that that's really interesting <laughs> um uh yeah or like just like i don't know like fears of parental aging too just like not not like just old people in general but it seemed that he was an only child shout out to my fellow only children <laughs> or the the burden of of like of parental care is like solely placed on them but um yeah I noticed that and that was like super weird in the introduction and it's also just like a question of like if you're gonna have like a fantasy of someone that you're like having a relationship or whatever like why would you not have like the perfect woman or like have something where the parents would like be approving you know it was like that weird scene where like they didn't understand like her art and was that just like a projection of them not understanding him and his like artistic pursuits or like what was happening with that i don't know i think that's fascinating because kind of off of that when we get into the basement like all of those paintings that were being played off to his parents as his own work were like not his work that's a little bit hard to wrap your head around too because he clearly has this like displaced sense of his own worth because he reads so much he reads a lot of like film criticism obviously and his i like his mind is packed with like quotes of philosophy that he can just pull right off the top of his head but at the same time when it comes to like actually expressing it in the same way that this hypothetical woman of jesse buckley actually does he doesn't really have it and he has to like imitate in a way he's just doing tracings of somebody else's work and I, I think that's really interesting. Arjun, the the reason that I wa yeah that I wanted to bring you on to this was because of what you commented on my Under the Silver Lake review, and like I I fully understand what you mean now. Like in yeah. the review, I was just talking about the the like David Robert Mitchell's like supposed point that you know all art is just like the culmination of other works of like just like poor imitations and amalgamations of other things right. and nothing is truly original and um you brought up the basement scene yeah i think it is fascinating i think it takes like a sort of special artist to make yourself question like why am i even watching this while watching a movie that you actually like and <laughs> it is it's fascinating to me because in the same way that under the silver lake is sort of exactly the type of movie that it is mocking. Like it is so packed with references. It is so like wearing its influences on its sleeve. This isn't really doing exactly that, although like there's a couple, you know, pretty obvious references, but it is sort of in like a very weirdly postmodern way that we haven't really seen from Kaufman, like packed with just like straight up rips of like quotes from Pauline Kael criticism, like, poems that are like passed off as hers that aren't actually hers and it's just so clearly like a combination of all of these ideas that Kaufman has and like you're saying like it really makes you wonder in the middle of the movie like wh why am I even watching this like are my ideas even my own ideas and it like really like 45 minutes through this movie gave me like a mini existential crisis like do do I even like Charlie Kaufman movies? Yeah and it's also like are you admitting that your movie is trash like <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Well, he, the thing that gets me is that he is like obsessed with, he's obsessed with art and meaning and, and like having, he's obsessed with the, not only the, the thing, but the canon of the thing. Like he's obsessed with the idea that there are, there is like a pantheon, there's a history of films and that there is like places in them and he's like also clearly obsessed with where he, he will fall in there but then he's also like he's like looking at himself and thinking like oh what a loser for thinking that <laughs> like just make the art and maybe i'm pulling ant kind into this because yeah. i'm reading his book he also released like a full fiction novel and his the main character is just this insufferable film critic who like hates charlie kaufman films 
And so maybe I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about Well, I think you're that. definitely onto something there because I haven't read Ankine, but I read a couple of excerpts from it where he's like, you know, building up all these lists and like, you know, like those Judd Apatow jokes that he makes. And like, you're so <laughs> right. Like he's like clearly obsessed with the idea of like categorizing things in a way that like, I think we all sort of have become in this like Twitter letterbox age letterbox. of appreciating <laughs> watching <laughs> movies. And it's like, sometimes even when I'm watching movies, like I'm realizing like how warped my mind has become where it's like sometimes even hard to just like focus on the movie without thinking about like what are the reactions about this going to become like how is the culture around this going to shape this and it is like it's extremely depressing and like as somebody who like we all do like appreciates good art and likes to you know like get sucked into these things like it's horrible to think like in the middle of this movie like what am I doing here? <laughs> is, is this a three star? Is this a three and a half star? <laughs> exactly. A... And I feel like the that's part of what makes the Pauline Kale scene so great is like, you know, I would say, I would assume that we have all been on both sides of that conversation in the car. Like after seeing a movie, the side of like someone literally like ripping it apart, like directly after seeing it in terms of like, structure and technical like <laughs> like feats and things like that and you're just like oh like i thought it was cool <laughs> and then on the other end there's like me on the way home from uh the rise of skywalker with my family where i'm like that was utter shit and they're like oh like we had a nice time like yeah. it's christmas <laughs> that was me like talking um, to anybody in my life about bohemian rhapsody for like three months afterwards <laughs> it's like how do you not get it <laughs> <laughs> my my rise of skywalker review on letterbox is my most liked review <laughs> and it's and it's literally just like an essay that i wrote about how terrible Rise of Skywalker was. Bring um, back negative criticism. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I definitely think you're onto something there, Brooke. Uh, oh, not Brooke, Alicia, excuse me. Um, I was gonna say, uh, Alicia, Brooke, you're, you're onto nothing. <laughs> I, yeah, <laughs> as I knew I would. <laughs> no. Did you Did you guys catch the uh, the A Beautiful Mind ending? I had to have it pointed out to me. Yeah, I, I, I'm in the same boat. I did not catch it, but I, I read about it. It seems cool. I don't know. I, I've heard bad things about that movie. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've never uh, seen it. But the, I guess that's uh, to get back up to I'm thinking of ending things. Is that is that Jake? Like, okay, so is is it a beautiful mind about like a really smart guy who's misunderstood by society? Well, I think like it's he's about... like paranoid, right? Doesn't he have? schizophrenia or something yeah, yeah he has like he has schizophrenia and an imaginary friend i don't remember if the guy who is the imaginary friend like used to exist but then he died or if he has never existed at all doesn't but, he also think like the russians are like writing things in the new york times to him and stuff like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah oscar yeah, winning film that we have not seen <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I have seen it, but, like, I don't think you need to see it. <laughs> um, I feel like the past, like, 30 seconds have sufficed. But, yeah, I get it. Like, what is that? Is it, j I mean, it, it obviously is piling on to the whole, um, you know, just, like, referential mania that is this movie. But also, like, is he, I guess it's just the fantasy of being a genius. He's not necessarily comparing himself to Nash, but um, just, yeah, imagining a, a connection there. And also, like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Well, it's interesting you bring up that, like, he's not comparing himself to Nash. Like, I, I agree with that. Like, I don't think he's calling himself a genius, but he also, like, is explicitly comparing himself to other filmmakers. Like, we get that whole Robert Zemeckis thing, which is, like, absolutely <laughs> hilarious. And, like, like we were kind of talking about earlier, like, he's so obsessed with, or maybe not obsessed with, but he clearly cares about, like, other directors and his contemporaries and how everybody is viewed in history and, like, sort of reappropriating these ideas of greatness and what, like, sappy dumb movies are in his mind and i think it's just such such a interesting like look into what his brain is and how his brain works and how he thinks about things and like it really reflects i think how like referential this movie is brooke did you find this movie funny at all <laughs> do i find it funny yeah um 
I don't think so. <laughs> no. I thought it was hilarious. I <laughs> really also thought it was I hilarious, but I was I was curious to hear Brooks like. Yeah. No, I was mostly just uncomfortable the entire time. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> no room for laughter. I didn't laugh out of she nerves, but. Her. Yeah, no. I so that, did that Robert Zemeckis title card not get you? Oh, the, like, okay, there was one moment when I laughed, and it was literally when it was, like, his his bedroom was labeled Jake's childhood bedroom, and that made me laugh, <laughs> and then they, like, explained it away as, like, his dad has Alzheimer's, and I was like, oh, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> never, <laughs> never mind. This was a practical use, but yeah, that. I'm sure Coffin uh, is also a terrible person and was laughing as well. Yeah. <laughs> I like when she flips over the ice cream and it doesn't spill. <laughs> yeah. What was happening? I was <laughs> so confused. Like I could not glean any sort of like information from like who that girl was or what was happening there other than like i really wanted an oreo mcflurry <laughs> after <laughs> seeing it i, I felt like, looks good. i felt like the like the hometown local kind of like joint you know is such a relatable thing to people in that like kind of whether it be like you were you know unpopular or ostracized when you were younger and so like going to places like that was really weird because people would be mean to you if you you know like like it, it, you know a girl who from school who works there or if it's just like for me like going back to a place like that in my hometown after like graduating is always just kind of weird and like sometimes is like fills me with dread <laughs> but sometimes it's more of a just like this is funny and weird type of thing but I feel like that is just kind of the epitome of the like this guy was bullied in high school and that is why he is what he is and this is like the core of like his memories that formed him into the person he is today and then the girl who was nice to him i guess is based off of someone he knew or is just another like part of his subconscious since they she has a rash on his arm i think later mm -hmm. jake has a rash on his arm that. and it it honestly kind of reminded me i i'm the worst person in the world to bring up inception right now but <laughs> But um, in terms of just, like, the very physical, uh, like, ways this world worked, this, like, psyche world of his, um, the way that little things pop up, little, like, cracks in the facade, yeah. um, I feel like that girl was, you know, just another part of his subconscious that huh. is, like, fighting him to not even, not to come back to reality, actually, um, but to maybe stay in the fantasy is what it seemed like she was implying. That's interesting. Cause I, I think that makes a lot more sense, but I just like my first thought when I saw, well, my first, first thought was I bet they're doing time travel in the back, which was not the case apparently. <laughs> but my second thought after that was that like, these must be kids of his who were like at the school that he was the janitor at. But I also think that doesn't totally make a lot of sense either. And I, I love that scene because the entire time I was just like, what is happening here? Like, oh, my God, this is crazy. But I still just have no idea. I, I like I like that a lot. Like the idea of that being part of his subconscious, though, because you do even if you are going to like think maybe these are people from the school, like you're exactly getting those kind of cracks in the subconscious. Like you're saying, like he's playing so much with like temporality and like different times and his mother aging super fast and like things not happening in the timelines that you would expect them to and that's like exactly like you're saying like that's that's inception right there like uh <laughs> my guy's getting I think incepted. you're right though i i think it might be both like the girl that he watches in the play at the school that, that the janitor watches in the play that girl i think in a way is also the girl who was in the play when he was a student you right. know or the girl who like bullied him in the hallways or like gave him weird look the the girl that he had a crush on when he was their age like i feel like there's a cyclical cyclical thing there so yeah i oh sorry brooke <laughs> um oh, okay there, there's a there's like a thing that we learned in my psych class is that like your brain like you cannot imagine like if you're dreaming or whatever anything that you've ever seen in a dream or like if you're just having a daydream or whatever you can't like just make it up it's always has to be like made up of parts of people that you know or like have already seen or whatever so 
it, it definitely is probably like a combination and also I was just reflecting on the fact that like if you did have such an awful like high school experience where you were like mercilessly teased or bullied or whatever and then how horrible it would be to <laughs> experience that again for the rest of your life as like being the janitor and like being I don't know by I guess some fault of his own like the creepy janitor <laughs> that like stares at girls as they're like just trying to live their lives and everything but yeah I don't know that idea just popped into my head so the I was also curious about this as it, it seems that we were all in agreement of how much this scene like kind of uh piqued our curiosity and so just now when I was going back and looking at scenes the girl the actress who is in the one of the blonde actresses in the ice cream place um is Tulsi, Tulsi, what is it called? Tulsi, uh, Gabbard. Gabbard. Tulsi Town, Tulsi Town. So she is the <laughs> same Sorry, actress that is playing the girl who makes fun of him in the hallway, who mm. like makes fun of Janner as he's passing, and the same girl who is playing, and notice I'm not saying same character because who knows if they're the same <laughs> character, but same girl who plays the main actress in Oklahoma who's singing where he's like mopping and is like looking at her. And the uh, the brunette girl with the brash is the same girl that he's walking down the hallway. Like the janitor's having walking down the hallway, and Jake is having an internal monologue about seeing uh, those kids who performed in Oklahoma in his hometown uh, years later, and he thought it was sad. Like, oh, they're just another like person shopping at the supermarket when they were stars on that stage or whatever the exact quote is. The camera like pans to her and you you get like her looking back at the camera and it's the same actress who's the brunette with the rash and then and then it goes to the Tulsi town and then they have that connection where they both have the rash so do with that what you will <laughs> I I tend to agree with uh, that it's probably some sort of manifestation of his past of his you know the, the blonde girls can can be like as as uh, the brunette girl says, the blonde girl is like, you're not like them, uh, she tells the young woman. Like, they're the pretty ones. They're the ones who are mean. They're the, like, they're sort of the embodiment of the, like, popular and talented girl in high school who he never had a chance with. And this other girl, this brunette girl, this um, girl who has rashes is, like, the girl who's more on his level and that he <laughs> feels a connection with and maybe is, like, maybe a uh, ex of his who worked at Tulsi town and that's why he has a weird fixation with it or something this is making me want to go pick through this movie again damn yeah. it <laughs> there are so many things man so many like well, tiny i think things. that it's it's so interesting that it's like a netflix movie in that specific case because we are kind of getting the opportunity because it's just there to watch as many times as we want now and like there haven't been that many good new movies that just get released onto netflix like this where it's like it's hard for me to think like what if like the shining had gotten released on netflix and like <laughs> everybody could have just gotten all their theories about it out in the next like month after it and then after that it was just kind of like gone it's like worrying but also just <laughs> fascinating that all of us can just go dig into this thing and like you know excavate it for any sort of opinion or idea that we could possibly get out of it in the immediate days after it it's kind of it's kind of amazing and I, I'm, I'm glad we're able to have this conversation because it really is just like endless stuff that we could dig out of this movie what will be the shelf life of this film that's a good question wow I I also think it's really interesting how Oklahoma is the musical of choice like I'm I just think of Oklahoma as such a like when I was younger and used to watch it like I didn't really think much of it other than you know another like classic American musical <laughs> but as I got older I was like wow this musical is really like horny and weird and like disturbing and subliminal and just like it's so it's so weird and I, I think that it kind of it fits in with the movie in that way and like obviously also the dream dance sequence like I, I thought that was incredibly done like it, it's such a 
kind of jarring juxtaposition to the rest of the movie, but also gives you kind of a, a chance to breathe um, and tells a story in a really interesting way without all the like, the like, you know, kind of exhausting dialogue that takes up a lot of the rest of the movie. But yeah, what did you guys think of Oklahoma? <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen it. I've not seen it either. Um, I was actually going to watch it with my mom. Like we the day before I watched I'm Thinking of Ending Things, we were going to watch a movie and then she got tired. But it was either going to be Oklahoma or another, one other musical. I don't remember. Something with the king in the title. I don't remember. <laughs> um, but is it? I don't know. I don't know. That well, was... that that's really fascinating to me then because I do think that it's hard not to think about what the connections between the two works are because he's clearly more obsessed with that than like almost anything in this movie like story wise alicia what did you think or like the sort of comparisons you could draw because that's something i was thinking a lot of and i kind of had the same thought as kayla we've been talking about this a little bit like we wanted to like dig in and watch oklahoma and think about like how you could make parallels between the two of them because i think that dance sequence it takes up so much time in this movie and it's clearly something we're supposed to think about a lot and for me it's just something like completely confounding to me i did not know what to make of that at all and I, i'm curious to think about what your thoughts are knowing the story of oklahoma and how that like reflects jesse Plemons' story i guess or the janitor's story i guess i think you know considering the the final number that he see, sings which is um from the character of judd in um oklahoma who is the villain who like is obsessed with the main female protagonist who ends up with uh his name curly am i just making that up because it like would be curly um the like the white hat of the of the musical basically um like their kind of love story is um being fought by judd who is like this kind of menacing presence in in their town and at one point the like the hero of the story tries to convince Judd to kill himself by kind of singing the song with him that prompts him to imagine what it's like like to to die and have people like memorialize you and he's like basically the song is saying like um uh I think it's it's called poor Judd is dead or, or that's just like the refrain but it's like oh imagine all these people grieving over you and um you know like your life is miserable basically but if you just kill yourself like things could be pretty great and he like (laughs) yeah and then but the song that that's not the song that he sings at the end of the um at the end of i'm thinking of ending things but i guess in that sense like that's probably the biggest parallel i see in a really depressing way like um but at the same time i don't think that jake that the janitor kills himself to be idolized or remembered as you know more than he was it seems like more of an escape than anything um but i don't know and in terms of the dance i guess i just interpreted it as him uh as you know the with the janitor kind of interrupting the dance between the two main dancers being like um this is his kind of miserable life interrupting what he thought it would be and also his um his kind of subconscious taking over um and taking him out of reality but then in the end the janitor kills the um the like male dancer right so i i don't know what do you guys think well it's so weird because like there's even he even has like a like a, a different like subconscious portrayal of himself as a janitor right in like a he's like a more attractive janitor i guess he's like (laughs) more fit and stuff and that's just like such a weird i don't know that's just like such a weird another like added level to that but i I read something like, like from the choreographer of that dance or whatever and apparently like um it was supposed to originally be on like a theater stage or something and they decided to do it in the high school hallways as like another manifestation of like how trapped jake was inside of this like high school reality or like high school situation 
Um, cause I like like several times when they're like practicing before and then in the ballet sequence, like the lockers are like getting in the way of the, like, you know, they're like nice little like high kicks or whatever. So I thought that was like a good, like physical, like manifestation of like how like enclosed his mind was and like trapped within this high school space. But like on a similar note, it's also like just so sad to think that like being in a high school play was like his like pinnacle of like coolness and fame to him was like being in a high school play when like for me I think of those people as like the theater kids who you know tight group amongst themselves but wouldn't really call them the most popular amongst the student body but Uh, yeah guys can I tell you that I loved the dance scene (laughs) and i teared up at it (laughs) wow i I, so i while watching it i was like this is this is great this is like good kaufman i'm very satisfied with this but it's leaving me cold like that's what i was thinking right before i got to the dance scene i was thinking that like you know like i see what he's doing here i think the janitor's jake and he lived probably a sad (laughs) life and like he had maybe a bad relationship or something you know like okay but like I don't see that relationship and it's not making me feel anything. None of this movie is really making me feel anything because I don't feel sympathetic towards this janitor figure. Like, I don't, it just wasn't clicking for me. And then, like, they started dancing and I was like, this is so beautiful. And I was like, because I was like, I was like, this is what, this is what he wants. Like, he's imagining this, this, like, if this dance is representative of their relationship that he wants, He's wanting something that is, like, just gorgeous and flows easily and, like, is a work of art. And that's, I think he conflates, like, art and and his failure to connect with people. And I think that that's, like, I just found it devastating when it ends and that his, like, janitor kills the other version of himself. And it's, like, he's put in his place and he's, like, no, like, this fantasy of dancing this this whole this whole fantasy of art that you have is false and look at the yeah. life you really lived and i found it like that's where that that is where the film's emotional core is for me at least um is seeing like this thing that he desperately wants and just does not have and it it hit me hard i'm not gonna lie i really really like and you that. describing it as like smooth and like kind of in sync and flawless like that like perfectly contrast with the way that jesse buckley and jesse plemons talk to each other when we first meet them like on that car ride which is just like constant there's like a constant discord in their conversation you know like whether she's thinking to herself and he kind of like half reads her thoughts or should i call them his (laughs) thoughts i guess and like interrupts them or they just like are every it's so uncomfortable it's just like everything is constantly like not quite lined up correctly and so i like the way that you put that with the dance scene yeah and i kind of feel like the whole movie he portrays like song and dance and musical theater as this sort of like pure form of artistic expression exactly like you're saying caleb and it almost seems like you know the main character was like an obsessed theater kid who was just never brave enough to actually put himself out there and like try out for the musical when he was a kid because you know like we see with those paintings like he's never able to sort of reach that sort of way of expressing himself artistically throughout his entire life and that's clearly a big regret of his and just like to see that sort of unfold like I I don't even think I thought about that I'm definitely gonna have to like check that out because I definitely was left a little bit emotionally cold in the way that you're describing and I'm putting that together I think is really interesting I'm gonna have to think about that Uh, that's really good that's really good (laughs) okay so after thinking for a second about the last song that he sings in I'm thinking of ending things isn't the last song uh I don't I don't know where it takes place in like the Oklahoma timeline but like it's it's about him you know like he's he's like oh I'm gonna go out there and like get myself the girl and like show them what I'm made of and whatever and I guess it's him just succumbing to the fantasy that he's created um as he sits dying um that's what it seems to me um 
and I guess Brooke interprets that as him, you know, finding peace. Um, I like that. And I don't really know how I... I like it, Brooke. I I needed (laughs) to hear it, even if I didn't believe it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, that just dawned on me. That's about as far as I can go with that. (laughs) Do you guys ever think about how Charlie Kaufman has a wife? (laughs) (laughs) And a kid? He has a kid. Like, how much, how, what do you think they think about this? This is crazy. Like, he's clearly still hung up on some girl from like 40, 50 years ago that <laughs> broke his little heart. She's like, who's Lucy? <laughs> <laughs> also, Jesse Buckley in this as Lucy um, reminded me a little bit of Ellen Page. I feel like they have that same kind of like wry smile and like they have a similar type of quirkiness to me. Mm, I like that. I loved her like subtle costume changes. Yes. As I loved loved that and like just him trying out like, you know, she was the same at her core, but like let's throw some pearls in there and see if I if I like a classy lady a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, and her her color like the one one thing I want to talk about is like some formal elements uh like cinematography cuz the the shot of her standing outside it's like the opening shot of the trailer i think like st- outside of the storefront like waiting for uh jess jake james have i been saying james i might have been uh jake jake uh when jake pulls up and it's like this like the camera pushes in and it's this like really lush color palette and she's like really colorful and she's smiling it's like i think it's a gorgeous shot um and it's also like such a contrast to when like where she gets to an hour later in the movie where she's in drab clothing and the set dressing behind her is just like the creepiest like purple or green wallpaper and she's like alone like there's a specific, the poster shot is what i'm thinking of uh, yeah and it's like such a interesting um uh, contrast there and i, I mean i think it's because it, it, my interpretation is that his, even in his idealized mind, his his great idealized woman, which he even calls her the ideal woman, mm. um, in the car, uh, even that just like is slowly rotting and is getting maggots in its stomach, and oh. is like you know like it's, um, I that's I wanted to ask y'all how y'all felt about like uh, the cinematography. Done by, oh, I wish I had his name. Probably. It's Lucas Zal, right? Okay, yeah. So yeah, it's the guy Cold who War? did Cold War, but I, I didn't see Cold War, but I saw Loving Vincent, which is an animated film that he was the cinematographer for a couple years ago, and it's like the same kind of thing. Like the way he works with colors, like you're saying, is, is really beautiful. And I, I think what works best in I'm Thinking of Ending Things is he knows when to sort of take that away and like make it drab a little bit. And I think that makes it even a little bit more powerful when he just kind of like overloads you with color, like in that sort of last high school whole set piece that we get, which I think is just really like vivid and gorgeous. And I also like like what you're talking about with cinematography, I think is interesting because it's such a departure from the ones that Kaufman doesn't direct, I think, and just the way that he uses angles too. And like, he's so deliberate about what he's showing you in every frame and I think that works really well to create this like dreamlike oneric atmosphere that we get especially in that house where it's like turning away from people for one second might just mean that you're completely leaving the scene that you thought you were in it's just so disorienting and like Kaufman's directing and the source material which I think is kind of similar although I've never read it just works so perfectly with the cinematography that they've got going on I really really loved that yeah the cinematography in the house is I think what comes to mind the most that one shot of her at the dinner table um, where like seemingly the rest of the family disappears and Mm. also the thing they do with the dog um, Mm. where you know he he only like magically appears every time like she thinks of him and also when he does appear yeah he's like stuck in a one distinct memory like one distinct image of like him shaking that's like so that is like weird little things like that are the most disturbing to me like that has stuck in my brain um yeah i thought it was amazing the cinematography and it's that it's that academy ratio it's that like (laughs) 
confined, boxy, like in the car, it's so claustrophobic. Yeah. It's yeah. So and to, to to great ends where it's like it's like, oh god, we've we've all been there. We've been in that conversation in a car with, that you can't escape from and you're just like grabbing at topics so to talk true. about and like <laughs> trying to figure out and and it's it's just it's the manifestation of jake trying to even have a conversation with himself and yeah. like you want that scene to end so badly yeah. the entire time like, like that first 15 minutes it's like 45 <laughs> minutes i feel it's like it feels yeah, long yeah, exactly. it's like it's like a third of the movie takes place in that car and that i mean that's bold if nothing else really yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. When the film started and like I saw that aspect ratio, I was like, oh, "Fuck!" Like this, I. <laughs> you don't <laughs> like, like a good Academy ratio? I, 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 it depends. But I was like, you know, it's this kind of movie. <laughs> um, but it also it makes me think of how in the, um, the adaptation of the Homecoming podcast that Amazon did, how they mm. use aspect ratio to um differentiate between memory and uh present day i feel like that's also i mean yeah it definitely serves that claustrophobic purpose but also uh temp temporarily i think it's all serves another purpose well apparently netflix has like really strict guidelines for what they typically want people to shoot on because they want it to like transfer well to iphones and ipads and whatever else you're watching on so i kind of thought it was at the very least like a nice departure from like the typical like tv serial setup that we get from netflix which i like like it, it clearly right off the bat like disorients you from most netflix movies unless you want to count like you know roma and like the people that really just want to take something and make it their own which i thought was like really like you know from the beginning you're not just getting just from the look of it like a typical run-of-the-mill netflix movie which you know for us i guess we kind of knew but <laughs> well, it's it's that and it's the editing which i wanted to ask y'all about and talk about because it's such a schizophrenic editing s style where like like a shot will end before you think it will but only by like a second like it's not it doesn't like in a conversation they'll have like audio edits where you somebody answers a question just like a second before you think someone would answer mm -hmm. and that really caught my eye because most or and ear because most netflix movies are like cut 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 like let's we know that people's like attention spans um are nothing now and so we need to like keep you don't look at your phone look at the movie screen you know like uh but i i found it was it was strange because at points in this film i was like that's that's almost like a misedit like that's almost like like somebody would have caught that in post on like a normal blockbuster hollywood film and been like no that's that feels weird like that feels wrong you need to fix that uh i don't know if y'all had any thoughts about the editing style No thoughts about the other. <laughs> I mean, yeah, definitely the way the the way that people spoke to each other was really affecting and um, was an early hint that something was off, that this wasn't, you know, reality. Um, especially in the way, yeah, in the car and also I remember there was like a very um, like strong instance in the barn when he's talking about the pigs of yeah one of them asking a question and the other answering before they've even like finished asking yeah, um baby goats or no baby sheep baby lamb. sheep yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Those... yeah and he's like i don't know why <laughs> that i don't just yeah everything was so uncomfortable and so funny i would also like to stress how funny i found this movie yeah um, I, the, the comedy of it is what gets me because there were so many points where I was laughing and my brother wasn't, and he was like, <laughs> why are you laughing? Um, and I think it, I don't know, maybe it's cause I was primed from seeing like Kaufman's explicit comedies. Like being John Malkovich is just yeah. like a straight up comedy. In it's like one of the of funniest it. movies ever, oh my so God. Funny. <laughs> and like, um, I recently w uh, watched Human Nature, which super underrated Kaufman, in my opinion, directed by Michelle Gondry. And he, it's like, it's always like in any letterbox, IMDb, any online list, it's always at the bottom. But I found it so hilarious. It's like a Coen Brothers level <laughs> farce. It's just like a straight up, it's a comedy. It's just like straight comedy. 
So I think knowing that and like seeing adaptation and other of his like really more explicitly like comedy is right. in your face. Right. Um, I think I was maybe primed to to see that in this film, whereas my brother was like, "Why do you think that's funny?" <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's just how Kaufman works. Like in showing something uh, that is like so pitiful, that's always you know just a a reflection of himself and how he sees himself as this like pitiful being um he always has this like like really brutal sense of humor um it's like you know look look at how how depressing this is and like how much of a self-scrutinizing drip i am (laughs) the only way to deal with it is to laugh um although that that won't make you happy it'll just kind of i guess numb you for the time being i don't know (laughs) yeah yeah it's like that when uh the animated pig comes on we haven't even talked about pigs yet which is when i was doing my rewatch did you guys notice the first i didn't notice on the first time the billboard that they passed and there's a pig on the billboard and it says come join me as they like pass i didn't notice that at all did not notice that Brooke, you're you're nodding your head. It looks like you noticed yeah, that. Yeah, I noticed it. Oh, like I noticed that, and like the thing. I want to talk like about the snow at some point. Um, I also have to go soon-ish. Um, but yeah, I was just thinking about how one thing that really struck me, like they saw the billboard and how like immediately they like get to places. You know what I mean? Like we we spend so much time on like a like on the road in the car and we like see that their conversation from the outside with like the windshield wipers going and everything and then we like pass that billboard and we're like immediately like at the family farm or whatever and i didn't take time to like think about what the what the pigs meant but i remember seeing that because i don't know if any of you guys like actually live in the country no right you're like near (laughs) near cities (laughs) but um yeah for me that was like something that there are no billboards on the countryside (laughs) where i am so i was like caught off guard by that one but yeah i don't know Uh, that whole uh i i tried to list every time i saw a pig in in the in the thing because you have you have the billboard and you have the the main dead pig at the or the talking about the dead pig at the farm you have a pig statuette in the living room um where like uh the young woman just sort of glances and sees like a young pig and like gives a little questioning look and then looks away you have the ham that they set out and they're like fresh from the farm (laughs) uh that they don't eat none of them ever eat anything um and then i think there might be a few more but i skipped to the end is uh the obviously the end animated pig that sort of guides jake to death to <laughs> heaven to um yeah uh and i i think we're supposed to connect the two and jake is looking at himself as just like a useless pig which is just i don't even like talking about it it's so depressing <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, I don't know. If they if they had showed me a pig filled with maggots that was dead in the farm and then served me ham, I probably also would not have eaten it. So I kind of yeah. see where they're coming from there. <laughs> yeah, also the the you know what what was going on with him giving that long spiel about, "Oh, my mom's health isn't great. Like, we should really stop for a snack." Asking to stop for a snack like six times and being like, "Oh, just so you know when we get there like she might not have made any food and then we have like this extravagant feast like on the table yeah Yeah. Um, that none of them eat and then that (laughs) yeah (laughs) that she ends up like she's the one this the guest is the one who takes up the plates of everyone else full of food and like they're all casual about it kind of an underrated food movie though because i feel like that cake looked pretty delicious not like i wanted a yule log (laughs) so fucking bad oh my god yeah uh brooke did you want to talk about snow real quick before we we wrap things up yeah i don't know it just it reminded me of like 
what's like in such a different way but similar thing where this snow is just so fucking pervasive and it's like the main thing that the young woman brings up like all the time just wanting to get back to back to the city or whatever and because of the snow it reminded me was it like mccabe and mrs miller is that the film yeah 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 who was the director of that he's altman, famous. altman yeah. robert altman yeah okay okay but like where the snow in that movie was the main reason that i got like nice vibes from it i <laughs> like that entire movie was like dealing with very like you know western like violent stuff and people were being murdered and prostitutes and everything but i was just like straight chill in the entire time i was like ooh, i feel so cozy it's um a super and cozy movie yeah <laughs> super cozy and then with this like i the snow if we're talking about like interiority or whatever and he like the, the weird scene where she talks about her paintings it's like my view like of the weather is reflecting that like it very much was this like this this snow was in no way cozy was in no way comforting even though and it's like brought up again in like different ways through like they mentioned that the house is like has a like big draft and like even though they like make this fire like no one is comforted in any way and then obviously like by the end he dies and i thought it was i thought it was like a very beautiful again i'm gonna say optimistic <laughs> beautiful whatever return to nature um also <laughs> sad about like his invisibility or whatever where like his entire car is like completely blanketed in snow at the end and it's just like has become a part of this like high school landscape hmm. that like you can't see and stuff so i don't know those were just my thoughts on snow if anyone else had any <laughs> um i did have a thought um about the the shot because it's on my list of like what what is this uh the shot where she like glances out the window and it's springtime and everything's mm. like every it's all grass and very green and then but her car is being snowed on, like their car. I mean, I the, the only thing I grasped from that was something like the oppressiveness of his death that's coming from the snow uh, can't escape. Like, it can't be got... It can't... He is like... I don't know, I'm kind of fumbling here, but it's... I don't know, if anybody has any interpretation of that... Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's just one of those. It's one of those Kaufman things where you're just like, yeah. You know, if it's I was really writing a film shot. paper on that, I could take that image and be like, this is a metaphor for this. <laughs> Maybe it's just like, like even as time and other things change, he is like forever static in you know either this one memory or this like kind of snowball of a bunch of different memories, and not only static but also forgotten and um like without any sort of legacy um like yeah like his history is literally being like whited out <laughs> by by everything that's happening and it's it's weird when i mentioned like the actual effects of hypothermia where it's called like people feel like they're on fire and they literally strip down and then that's like what happens and that's the part that like also leads to death is a very you know like back to obviously like the stripping of like the janitor uniform is also somewhat significant um and like that janitor uniform like appears in the basement laundry or whatever yeah. and it's like drenched yeah. in in water and we like see it again so right i don't know right yeah i, I kind of also think like in you know i, I do think it is super fun and like to pick at all the threads of this and like that is kind of what has lodged its way in my brain but like to go full circle to our Pauline Kale conversation like you do sense a little bit of Kaufman just being behind the scenes like no like you know it's just meant to like you're just supposed to enjoy it like everybody who is just like picking this apart is so dumb and you know everybody else who is just like you know sitting back and enjoying the ride like no you guys are the right ones here. But at the same time, it just feels like antithetical to everything Coffin's done. It's such like a paradoxical and almost like hypocritical piece of work that makes it like that much more interesting, I think. <laughs> yeah, when he drops that Guy de Bourge, uh reference, oh I was like, you're trolling every film major out there. Yes, the fucking spectacle. <laughs> 
cut that out. Um, out. All right. I think that's a good place to to end on it here. Um, Any final thoughts? Anything? Yeah. Would you recommend it? Would you not? Definitely a recommend for me. And I also like that Jesse Buckley has now been in one of my favorite films of the year with this. And then I think just objectively one of like the worst films of the year that should probably not exist with Doolittle. So oh, really like God. getting both ends of the spectrum with uh, Jesse Buckley, the young, talented <laughs> wonderkind here. Did you see Doolittle? <laughs> I did see Doolittle, yeah. <laughs> It's it's worth it only for the magnificent ending of Robert Downey Jr. sticking his fist up a dragon's butt, which actually happens in the movie Doolittle. That does sound a like a dragon. It's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> and Rami Malek. That's I'll I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, uh, go ahead, Caleb. I was no, you go ahead. You got it. Uh. Yes, I would recommend it uh, tentatively, depending on the <laughs> emotional state of who I'm recommending it to. Um, and I, yeah, I liked it. I think that there are a lot of questions um, that, you know, you can grapple with afterwards, which is my favorite thing, is like ambiguity. And um, in terms of, you know, like placing it in. Kaufman's career um and like you know there are little bits and pieces of obviously adaptation with like um the the treacherous like process of um creating new art or basing new art off of old art and like um you know not even like creating anything new but rather just like constantly referencing the fact that you're not creating anything new and um and like also i think there there are comparisons with her as well like i i think that it's impossible to call this feminist or not feminist um there's like a lot to talk about there but the yeah the concept of um creating a woman who somehow manages to like gain agency and sort of ditch you in the end um is really interesting and I, th- I think that he's exploring that uh, while also, you know, reinforcing things that people have had problems with in the past. Yeah. Um, but I don't have a problem with it. I, th- I think all of it is um, creates worthy discourse. So, yeah, I enjoy watching and talking about it. All right. Well, uh, I'll probably include all of our ads for Letterboxd and Twitter in the show notes. Uh, oh, no. Um, th- thanks for listening. Uh, and in the meantime, we will be much like Jesse uh, Plemons' character and I'm thinking of any things. We will be watching too many movies and filling our brain with too many lies. I thought you were going to say, much like him, we are going to be covered in snow, <laughs> sitting in our car, dying of hypothermia. That's much nicer. Both, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's the backup plan. Mentally, I'm mentally. And I sit by myself like a cobweb on a shelf by myself in a 